Hi, everybody. So this is going to be an interesting podcast to do. Uh, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 last uh, week, and I was kind of disappointed in it. It wasn't a horrible movie, but it, it wasn't what I hoped it would be. And I felt pretty much consistently disappointed in almost every blockbuster in the last two years uh there there with a few exceptions we'll talk about uh, and uh so i'm trying to figure out why and so i was talking with my friend david and he agreed to come on and kind of hash this out with me so we can figure out what it is maybe it's just me maybe i'm the problem i don't know but uh we're going to talk about some different problems that we see uh on the blockbuster scene and if if uh, somebody was going to ask us for advice what we would suggest uh, to help kind of fix these problems. And this is going to hopefully not be too much of an event session. <laughs> hopefully it'll okay. be constructive. So, uh, David, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, as I unprofessionally try to set things <laughs> up in the background. But uh, hello, everybody. If you don't remember me from uh, the last two weeks on the animation bracket, my name is David. I have been reviewing movies for about three years now on YouTube. And... Uh, like Rachel, I have been sadly burned by the uh, blockbuster disappointment bug many times before. So, yeah, yeah I'm so, ready. So it's going to be fun. Um, so the first topic that I wanted to talk about, I'm calling it too many tent poles. And this is the problem that I see where it used to be that there were like two or three, honestly, big movies every year that everybody looked forward to, that everybody bought tickets for, and and that you know you were really excited about. And and honestly, now there you know there would be a couple in the summer, there'd be one at Christmas, that kind of a thing. And now there is one every weekend almost that there is a big you know we're getting Kong School Island in. March, we're getting, uh, you know, Beauty and the Beast, we're getting uh, these big movies, uh, Fa Fate of the Furious, it was in April, we had, uh, and, you know, now we have uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy in May, it's just every weekend there's something, if you um, uh, look at, uh, I think the first couple weeks of June, you have uh, Captain Underpants, you have Wonder Woman, you have The Mummy, you have, I mean, just so many that it almost becomes overwhelming. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like the norm back in the day, especially like the 70s and 80s, was like there would be one or two big blockbusters that would like pay for all the smaller like independent movies. Yeah. Nowadays, it's like, I mean, it was a business back then, but I feel like there was more urge for creativity within filmmaking, even though that's still present today, but it's like now it's like a billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's become so much more about the brand and recognition. I mean, before the dark Knight came out, there was, well, when the dark Knight did come out, it was like, that was like the third billion dollar movie. Now in 2017, almost 10 years later, we have about 30, one billion dollar grossing movies mm -hmm. and three of those grossed over two billion so yeah. everybody's trying to get their one billion dollar movie one billion dollar franchise of movies yeah and i feel like uh, with so many of these like tentpole movies you end up it just sort of dilutes them it, it, they're just not as i don't know if it's just the the same sort of uh, care maybe isn't put into them or if it's uh, I mean I'm sure they do try really hard to make the best movies they can but uh, I don't know like it just it just feels less special like I was talking about it with my friend Chelsea the other day that I I was able to love The Little Mermaid for like three years because there was just not that many other animated films that came out and now it's like every, I mean, there were whole years in the 80s when there were not a single animated film released, none. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that? Like 19, I think it's 1984 and 87, I think were the years that there were no mainstream animated films released. And now there is one almost every month and sometimes multiple. There are three animated films in June alone. 
that are being released. Yeah, I mean, I've I've talked about this many times of being, you know, with the fatigue and everything, especially with my my buddy Luke. I've talked to him about like when we talked about when Star Wars like was being re well not rebooted but like revamped. We're like, okay, let's maybe stick to one movie a year. It's like I like that idea because kind of what I'm dealing with right now with Marvel is like I think I'm gonna get fatigued with like their franchise because we're getting two movies a year. Now we're getting three movies a year. It's like we need room. We need to be able to breathe and appreciate what's going on. I mean, yeah. look at like the original Star Wars. Like we had to wait three years in between for a new movie. Like for me with like the Batman franchise, I had to wait three years after Batman Begins, then four years after The Dark Knight. You need some time to breathe and kind of appreciate it. I mean, yeah. when we get it all together, like at first we like it, but too much of something good is not good. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you just, you don't have the time to kind of, I don't know, like some people could say, well, you, you know, you, you get the, the hype is, a, is builds up too much, but when you have too long, but it may be, it, I don't know, but there's also something to that about like being a, having time to like be like a true fan. Like I look at the difference between uh, the response Yes, like some people say Frozen was way overhyped or whatever. Some people say that. But as far as like my my nieces and their sort of attachment to whether it's Frozen or Moana or, you know, whatever it is, it's just not the same as it was for me with The Little Mermaid where, you know, it was practically, it was everything. You know, and I was uh, singing all the songs and just because there was just nothing else like to really kind of compare it to or to uh, – you know, we hadn't had a princess movie since uh, 1959 and <laughs> when, when, when yeah. the movie came out and I don't know. So that's why I, I just, I don't know. I just feel, I do I agree with you. I feel sort of exhausted uh, and it's hard to have as much fun, I think, as they want us to have because it's like, you feel like, oh my gosh, I just saw this kind of event movie last week. And so it feels less special and it just feels less fun. Yeah, I mean, exactly. When talking about the hype, it's like, you know, hype is good. I mean, mm -hmm. sure, we can get burned by it. I mean, yeah. I definitely did with a lot of these movies. But, you know, if you say I'm watching The Force Awakens and then yeah. I turn around and then I'm going to go see Rogue One, it's like that 10 year wait for The Force Awakens, that was like the biggest hype buildup of all time. And I loved every single moment of it. Yeah. It's like, and it's like, and, you have to wait just one more year for the next movie. It's like, oh, I already experienced this hype. Yeah. Like the hype is not what it was. And sure, it may burn us, but it's like at the same time, we want to savor in the hype because mm -hmm. as fans, we get to rejoice and like fanboy out about something that we love and that we're passionate about. Yeah. Well, and it's just like it, when you have something that's sort of, you know, you say you kind of make the best of a not as great a product if that makes sense when you only have when you have like very little of it so like i let's say a a movie in the 80s like i again i use animation because that's sort of my my uh my uh, home but i a movie like oliver and company is very flawed it's not a great movie but because we didn't have that much you really loved it mm -hmm. but because so like say a movie that I really didn't like last year, uh, like uh, X-Men Apocalypse, didn't like it. And, and, but I think if, if I, if I, it was that, if that was the only superhero movie I got all year, then I probably would like it yeah. more <laughs> because, you know, because it'd be more special. Yeah. And, de and definitely speaking with that, like too much, like say for me example, last year, out of all six superhero movies that came out, I only liked one of them, and that was mm -hmm. Deadpool. I mean, me, like Batman is my bread and butter, my number one passion, and I was out of this world excited for Batman versus Superman. Superman, my second favorite superhero, and that movie left me hurt, cold, damp, and sour for <laughs> I don't know how long. For about a month's time, I'm like, I had like no desire to go to the movies anymore because – my energy was like drained from me because of how utterly disappointed I was. Yeah. Now the movie is not like the worst of all time. I think when people do that, they're going way too overboard. Yeah, I agree. But it left me so disappointed that my expectations were even lowered for like civil war. Mm -hmm. And then I'm in the minority. I didn't like that either. 
And then my expectations were even lowered more for Apocalypse. At first, I somewhat liked Apocalypse, but then I watched it again, like, wasn't so good because my expectations were so low. And then yeah. the same with Suicide Squad and Doctor Strange, so <laughs> low that it just didn't matter. Yeah. Like, even, even bad movies that came out, like, initially, I'm like, I didn't mind it as much, but after pondering more, I'm like, you know, I actually really didn't like that. But it's because my expectations were lowered so much by, like, the cluster of so many blockbusters and just yeah. trying to cram it all in together. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of these, uh, particularly the next sort of topic I wanted to talk about is I'm calling it cinematic boredom. And this is too many cinematic universes. And this is, I think, a huge problem because it used to be like I, Marvel was totally brilliant when they came up with the idea of the cinematic universe. That was revolutionary for them to come up with it. And they're still the one that has executed it the best of anybody. Everyone has been trying to execute it, but they have not been able, nobody else has been able to succeed really in a cinematic universe. But, and of course, anybody's going to want to try to jump on a successful bandwagon, you know, a successful yeah. thing. But uh, the problem is, is that people aren't focused on making this is probably the biggest problem with blockbusters today is people aren't focused on making a good movie. They're focused on making a franchise. And I, I think it used to be that, that you, you used to have, they're focused on making a universe instead of a good movie. And it used to be that like movies would earn a sequel, mm -hmm. you know, like there's something like the original star Wars. You know, it was a huge risk, and, and it was a, a, a huge gamble, and they put it out, and it had heart, and people loved it, and so then they earned a second movie, and then they earned a third movie after that. It, there was no, you know, sort of guarantee that you were going to get all of these movies, and I, I know I just feel like most of these movies... I see them and they just feel hollow because they're not like a full story. They're not like a, I don't know, like at least. Like I, you need to watch the next movie to understand all these setups yeah. for this yeah. movie. So you end up feeling kind of manipulated. And that was my biggest problem with Batman v Superman is that I, it felt very manipulative to me that the, I, when they're killing off Superman, really made me mad that's my biggest problem with that movie if they hadn't done that i would have been more okay with it but uh, it was such an obvious ply into you know this like phony attempt at a cliffhanger and i just feel like those movies have treated superman so badly and turned him into this this sh person who's ashamed of who he is and his powers and what he can do instead of being a symbol of hope. And then for him to die and have this funeral and this long, oh, I hated it. I hated that they killed Superman so much. And to me, that was just emblematic of worrying more about starting up a universe and, and just horrible things like the way they introduced the Justice League and stuff like that. You know, that it's like you're worried more about setting up this universe than you are about telling a good story. Yo, know, definitely. I mean, like I, I equivalently Batman be Superman to like to the MC, because MCU definitely has some missteps. Like Iron Man two was a misstep for me because that movie seemed nothing but pure build up to the Avengers, and you had a terrible villain in there that was probably equivalent to how terrible Lex Luthor was in BBS, at least if you ask me. But mm -hmm. and the same thing with like Avengers: Age of Ultron. Even though I actually like that movie more than most people. That was more of like a stepping stone for Captain America Civil War and more so for kind of cleaning up some things with Winter Soldier, which really what that was. It was more like a, like say, like a three episode series, like Captain America Winter Soldier was the first one and then you go to Age of Ultron and then Civil War. Mm -hmm. But like if, much like you said with Star Wars, like they said, they gave you, they set up a complete full first story. Warcraft didn't do that as well, if you ask me, because I think there's a lot of mythology there that i as a non-warcraft fan didn't understand and Me also too. yeah you look at something like like say batman begins they made that not even knowing if they were going to have the dark knight next and it felt like a complete story yeah. even the dark knight because most 
like especially like the first movie in a series, if they do set up as like its own story, then the next one usually will like set up for the third movie, kind of like what Matrix did. But something like The Dark Knight didn't do that. While it was still there as an option, it still had its own complete story. Yeah, exactly. Like you can still, uh, you can still have sort of a mild cliffhanger or mild thing, but it's still uh, like the Back to Future movies. Mm-hmm. They they have you know an end and you know leading you into the next movie, but it's still it's its own story it's its own thing and and more than just even that uh, it's it's that you feel like the the focus of the filmmakers and the focus of the story is this movie (laughs) you know like there aren't sort of scenes where you're like what are we doing why are what who is this person like why are we being introduced to this character or why is this character in this scene Uh, i have no idea you know or, or what are we doing and and you see that more and more and more and and i don't know like i i liked civil war just because i felt like it was an interesting uh i I liked the fact that tony and steve and the progression of their characters up to that point and i was so invested in them and i thought the action was pretty fun that i i did enjoy it but i i I think that for the most part, you know, you just, you watch these movies and you're just like, there just seems like so much extemporary stuff that doesn't, you know, like it's one thing to have like Easter eggs or little things, little clues, you know, that stuff's fun. But some of this stuff, it just feels, feels like focus, focus on the movie, like focus on what you're doing, you know, like, uh, I don't know if that makes sense. I know that that it does make sense. I mean, like BVS is like a prime example of that where there's like so many Easter eggs. I mean, you know, yeah. Zack Snyder, definitely a big fanboy, much like me, but that was like such, because what's amazing is how, because I actually like Man of Steel. I really love it. I know you're not as big on it as I am, but what I can say for Man of Steel is that it was its own movie. Yeah, no, I like, agree. It, it didn't even set up like a sequel. I mean, even the DCEU, even though a lot of people criticize it, even it knew you need to set up with the one full movie with its own story. And it did that. Then it goes around and doesn't do that with its follow up. But still, you need to establish the first movie of any cinematic franchise or universe needs to have a singular story from beginning to end that allows you, that has the possibility of having sequels. Not that it sets up a sequel. Mm-hmm. You need to have like, Oh, you see the possibility and the potential for uh, n- newer stories in this franchise. Yeah, because a lot of people are really critical of Force Awakens, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but at least to me, it had like a clear beginning and a clear through throughout the movie. You know, where you had Ray trying to get the plans, you know, the, the from BB-8 to to the rebellion you know trying to trying to get trying to help bb8 that was the and then and then trying to find luke like that and then at the end you find luke you know so there was this 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 thread that was through the whole thing which i i think that a lot of a lot of these movies are just missing even the recent kong school island which i was disappointed by i didn't think it was very good and you know that movie just felt all over the place and you know at the end you find out, you know, of course, that they're doing this cinematic universe and it's all going to be part of Godzilla. And I don't know. I was just like, oh, why, <laughs> why do we need that? Like, why can't we just have a good King Kong movie with heart and emotion and characters that make sense? And Not ones that are just there because they're good trackers and they take photos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I uh... love Brie Larson and Tom Hiddleston, but really their characters did not belong in that movie at all. No. It really should have just been Sam Jackson and John Goodman's movie. <laughs> well, yeah, because they seem like they were in totally different movies, Sam Sam Jackson. And and I, I didn't like those uh, those lizard creatures at all. I thought they were a total miss. But but like, yeah, you have you have Tom Hiddleston, they've just left the boat. And he's like, Oh, I, I, I think there might be a river somewhere or something. We have to go this way to the river. I'm like, You just left it. Like has it been a day? Yeah. Like uh, what like what's going on like, I don't... here's the funny thing because <sighs> i'm a I, I i really do like peter jackson's king kong i don't know how you feel yeah. about it but like a lot of people criticize it saying oh it's too long well 
To some extent, I'll agree to that. It, you probably should have chopped off about 30 minutes of it. But at the same time, you turn around and look at this King Kong, it probably should have been longer because there's a lot that is in there that needs to like, be expanded upon a little bit more, especially mm-hmm. like character and kind of like the editing and the pacing of like the story. Like you could probably take some things out to make it better, but you probably need to expand the runtime. And so that's yeah. probably why I like King Kong more because you actually get some development with the characters. You actually have a reason to connect with them. There actually is a purpose behind them. Unlike this new one where it's like, ah, it's really just a dumb monster film, but it could be more than that because the original King Kong wasn't just a dumb monster movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely not. It has emotion. It's about how we treat things that are different, people that are different and how, how we uh, exile you know, people and uh, our sort of need to sort of uh, turn, turn things that are different in almost like a sideshow kind of thing and, and to gawk at them. And, and uh, it's, it's a moving, moving movie. It's really, really good. And so I don't know, it was very frustrating. Another movie that really frustrated me, this, I guess that's, well, actually we could kind of go into the next uh, for this is actually, that. Before um, we do that, can I pick you back off your force awakens deal? Yeah. Like what are you, like what you're saying, how it like has point A to point B, that's very similar to like Lord of the Rings. And right. I think that's very present with this new Star Wars trilogy is that it's like this three-parter, which right. makes sense. I mean, it's not like a 14 part It's like a TV show, episode one, all the way to 14. But like mm-hmm. it had the beginning, middle, and end, but also has this continuing storyline that's going to go on to the third one. I yeah. think that's what was present in Lord of the Rings too, where you accomplish like the conflict is resolved in the first one, but there's but the main conflict of the whole saga is still to be resolved, and you're going to resolve that in the final movie. Yeah, yeah, and and that was the problem with the Hobbit movies is there's there wasn't it, they like they thought that that being in that world was going to be enough. You know, people think oh, it's enough to be in Kong's world to have these visuals to have these, uh, and it's not. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. not enough just to make a Terminator movie and have Arnold in there. Like you have to have like a good story and you have to have a good performances and you have to have, otherwise it's just ugh. like Terminator that was, Genesis. If that was the case. I would love BVS just because Batman and Superman are there. Like, yeah, exactly. I like I can't just have the characters there. I need a good story. Mm-hmm. I can't just like Rogue One just because it's a Star Wars story. I need to exactly. like exactly Like, just because it's a part of like mythology and lore and certain franchise or concept that I am a fan of, there needs to be a good story there. You can't just throw them in there because if that's the case, then I might as well just go read a comic book or yeah. watch a TV show or something. Exactly. And I think that people are way too quick to, I mean, if people like it, they like it and that's yeah. cool. Yeah. But like, uh, but you're not doing your franchise any favors by giving it a pass when they just sort of put you in that world. That that was another problem I had with fantastic beasts and where to find them. Like the, the, the story was so I thought disjointed between the darker elements and the like campy slapsticky elements. And there, there's, I think that they were convinced that we just bring them back to Harry Potter. We're going to play the Harry Potter music and, and everybody will love it. And that's not, well, I mean, it made a billion dollars. So I guess everybody did love it. But, but for me, I, I left feeling empty and feeling frustrated about it that I, I don't know that I just didn't get that good of a story and I didn't like the lead protagonist. And so that was my biggest problem with that. And so, yeah, it's not enough just to, to if you're going to do a cinematic universe tell good stories in that universe and and i i have to admit i was kind of waiting for the i guess the the to have what? my my marvel disappointment mm-hmm. moment because other people had had theirs is it, like is this, is this the first one for you yeah my oh, brother wow. my brother had his with age of ultron but i still liked it because i felt like at the time I, I was still sort of riding that and I felt like the sort of the backstory that we got and that buildup of uh, particularly Tony and, and Steve and, and their characters and how we got to know inside into Natasha a little bit more about what happened to her past, all that stuff really worked for me. And so I, I, I didn't mind it. And I thought that Ultron was creepy enough 
and I liked his voice and things. So I, I was, I, I enjoyed it. And, uh, <laughs> and like I said, I enjoyed Ant-Man. I thought it was a fun little heist movie. I liked that it, it, uh, and I, I love Corey Stahl. Uh, I, oh, I have he's a great. little crush <laughs> on him and, <laughs> and House of Cards, yeah, House of Cards and, and, uh, Midnight in Paris. Uh, he's plays Hemingway in that. And Is I love, that? yeah, I love that's, him as Hemingway. That's, that's still on my, my watch list. I need to watch I, that. I want them to make a whole movie with him as Hemingway. I would love it. But anyway, and so I, I was, I was just waiting for the, that to kind of happen. And I, I still really liked Civil War because of the relationships and the new Spider-Man I thought was great. And I thought it was, you know, pretty fun action. I enjoyed it. Uh, and then Dr. Strange, I liked, I think, partly because I just thought Benedict Cumberbatch was so good in the lead. And I felt for amazing. his character. Because, like, I am a huge Cumberbatch fan. Like, I am the Cumber, B-I-T-C-H, that yeah. everyone would call me because I love him in Sherlock. I loved him as Khan. I don't care what any of the Star Trek fans think. I think he was a great Khan. And I thought he was really good in Doctor Strange. But, and this is kind of some of my issues with, like, not just Marvel, but, like, anything where it's like, I feel like I've seen this before. Because that's probably where majority of my flaws lie with uh, Dr. Strange and Ant-Man is that I felt like I've seen this before because mm -hmm. it felt so similar to the first Iron Man, which is a movie that I love. It's still to this day, my favorite MCU movie, but it's like, it worked good the first time, but, but yeah, like, I think as long as you do it right, it's okay. But I feel like they tried to copy it and didn't really execute as well as the first one did. But that's just me. Well, for me, I felt like he got to a humble place more than than uh, Tony did in the first Iron Man when he's outside the the door begging for help I thought it takes I think it takes Tony three movies really to get to that point and maybe that was too too fast maybe that was too much you know for for some to kind of feel invested in his character maybe some people like having three movies for him to grow and develop but I I so that in that way it was different enough but i i'm not gonna certainly not as good as the first iron man of course uh but uh it was it i was entertained by it and and it was so visually beautiful uh although it did make me a little motion sick <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah so we got up here to guardians of the galaxy volume two and it's not a horrible movie like, I don't think you wouldn't say, would you say that Civil War and Doctor Strange are horrible? Oh, like, no, no, no. Just, a movie like, a movie that I was just wanting to buy, Fan Four Stick, I would definitely yeah. call it a horrible movie. <laughs> okay. Civil War, right. I would say, is like around the, and Doctor Strange are around the average area for me. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of things I liked in them. And like Civil War, I love Spider-Man. I loved Black Panther. Like going into Civil War, I was like all team Captain America because like mm -hmm. Captain America has won me over with the Winter Soldier and what he did in Age of Ultron. But I came out of that loving Iron Man again because I kind of felt like I was losing interest in Iron Man. But Civil War regained my interest mm -hmm. in Iron Man because I feel like there was so much more added to Tony Stark in that movie. Yeah. Well, the that biggest, really just made me appreciate it more. Yeah. The biggest problem with Civil War on retrospect, when I really, you know, had some time to think about it, is that letter at the end. I think that that, they're just so afraid to kind of end, to end their movie on a, like a bittersweet note, I think. That yeah, they they're have afraid to, have, to go the darker route. They, they have to have right Steve there. write this letter to Tony about how everything's going to be good and he's always going to be there for him and all that stuff. And I think, I would not have done that letter, taken that out. <laughs> I think, um, I think uh, two glaring issues for me personally was, and one of them is more of a issue with the entire cinematic universe is that hardly anyone ever dies that I've really yeah. grown to care for. I mean, like the ancient one, she dies in Doctor Strange. I'm like, I don't care about her. Mm -hmm. Like, but like Rhodey, if Rhodey died, not only would that have been good, for like story purposes, like it would, cause like as someone who's been invested with him for so long, yeah. what could that do for Tony Stark? Like that could yeah. set up endless possibilities for Tony Stark. And another issue I had was that it's called Captain America Civil War. I felt like Iron Man completely hijacked his movie. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. That's because, valid. because as a, 
a massive lover of the Winter Soldier. I loved everything that they set up in that movie. And I thought it would set up like a brilliant Captain America end off to the trilogy. And I feel like it was kind of, I feel like I was kind of betrayed by that because it was like, they try to cram in Captain America 3 with like Avengers 2.5. Yeah. That was just a personal issue I had. No, that makes sense. I can see that. And and in a way, because Spider-Man was on Tony's team and he was a big highlight of the movie, I can see that sort of feels the same. So, okay. So the next topic that I wanted to talk about is I call it IP overload. Carry, carrying caring more about the, the about names French and franchises than ideas. And I, I, I do feel like that is a big problem now is that we got to get the next big IP. We got to get the next thing that people know about, you know, whether it's, it's uh, King Kong or power Rangers or uh, transformers or, you know, whatever it is. And, and I, I don't know, for me, I felt like you had this a little bit in, in rogue one that, you know, we, we have, all of these sort of Star Wars touch points and Star Wars things. Oh, you remember this and you remember this and you remember this and we look at this and, and you didn't have like a good story with characters that I cared about, you know, mm-hmm. like it, it was just, I don't know. I felt like it was, I was very disappointed. I came out of it like. Yeah, I, mean, I remember like the first, the opening night when I watched it, I was kind of tired at the same time. Uh-huh. So after the movie was over, I'm like, did I, did I really feel like it's probably average or am I just tired? So I went immediately, I bought another ticket to go see it the next day, the first showing and walking out, I felt exactly the same way because like, like we said earlier, you need a good story and good characters. You can't yeah. just throw slap on Star Wars. I mean, the last act saved the movie for me. If yeah. the last act was not as good as it was, I probably would have really disliked it. Not hate, but probably really, really disliked yeah. it. Yeah. But like Han Solo, there, we have a Han Solo movie that I do not want at all. I think a Han Solo movie is a horrible idea because... Like, I, I will try my hardest to go in and have an open mind, but I feel like it's almost a lose-lose scenario because go in, whatever Alden Ehrenreich does as Han Solo, if he does a Han Solo impersonation, we're going to complain about it. If he takes it as his own, we're going to complain about it. And I feel like that's just a lose-lose scenario. And I, I would rather see, like, an Obi-Wan story where, like, we get to see what he's done between episode three and four. I'd rather see like a Darth Vader movie. Or like, how if, about like one of the great things about Star Wars Rebels is that it's about new characters. Like every oh, once in a while you'll too. have a Darth Maul, you'll have a, you know, come in that we know, but it's about these new characters that I really, really love. You know, it's got, uh, I mean, some of them are from Clone Wars, I guess. So you got uh, the, you know, Kanan and Ezra and, and uh, <laughs> um, Sabine and, you know, these I've really become invested in who they are and they had the chance to do that with Rogue One. And, you know, I even read the, the novel going into it, I read Catalyst. So I was as ready as I could be. And I just thought the story was so weak, especially anything to do with Saw Gerrera. His character was not built up at all. And I had no and he idea. Was so good in Clone Wars. Yeah. Like, like watching it, him in Clone Wars, he is a great <laughs> character. Yeah. And the characteristics of him in Clone Wars compared to Rogue One are completely two different characters. Yeah. It's like they just said, oh, well, we're going to, we're going to, you know, explain this plot hole and but they didn't like craft a good story around it about how Jin evolved and who she was and 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 what she wanted out of life and what her goals and dreams were i didn't get any of that my biggest my biggest question is because we know massive reshoots were done for rogue one how much of it was gareth edwards version and how much of it was it disney that wanted to because we still don't know. I mean, yeah. they've been jumping because, around it. Like but Cassian at the beginning is, you know, he shoots at this guy. He's like this, uh, he, you know, he's this, you know, assassin, basically. Yeah, and, yet, and then, and he, has then he, he on his face. Like you see, like, <laughs> yeah. kind of trembling on his face after he has, has to do this terrible deed. It's like, oh, no, don't worry about that. Just, and then he, yeah, and then he becomes basically this guy that's there to hug Jin at the end. Like, why? What is his, like... I don't know. Like, what is his motivation? Where does he go? Like, why, why does he 
do what he does. I have no idea. And, and the rest of the characters, I, I didn't even know their names. Like it was so confusing because you have like Bodie who is the, uh, is the pilot. And in the beginning, he's like tortured and you're like, why is he being tortured? Who is he? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? And you never really, you never really know. I, I, it was like an hour and a half into the movie and somebody mentions Bodhi. And I'm like, who is that? I have no idea. And I shouldn't be wondering who a character's name is if they're a major part of the team mm -hmm. an hour and a half into the movie. And, you know, I don't know. Then there were just stuff that just really frustrated me. Like, like the, like Sharut is supposed to be this interesting character, but he's really just kind of like the mystical blind man, you know, like yeah. in, in, uh, in, uh, in, you know, so, sort of tropes, they talk about like, you'll have like the disabled person who's like super powered because of their dis disabilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's kind of a, 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 a trope and you totally have that in Rogue One. And they don't really explain why, you know, has he had training? Like, is he, you know, is he just strong? Like, and, um, anyway, and, and, uh, he's supposed to, he uses the force in a way I have never seen the force being used before with, you know, I am the force, the force is me. I am the force, the force is me to, to turn that switch. And nobody in the whole rest of the movie uses, I've never seen that in Star Wars ever. Uh, and, uh, and <laughs> it just felt like saying like Han Solo, that's not how the force works. <laughs> like, like what? This isn't even I'm a really Jedi. Old. And, and he ends up getting like, if, if that was the way the force works, like why didn't the rest of the characters use that? Or why didn't, why didn't we use that? Like, I don't know, like Obi-Wan when he's fighting Vader, like why didn't he use that mystical power that's going to stop? I don't know. Like, I, I just felt like, I just felt like it was just hollow. It was frustrating to me. And yeah, they really, they really kind of did what most franchises try to do is like they cram in so many characters because yeah. they want to give you so much. Like, oh, give them this. Maybe this could give us a spinoff because, like, Chur Churitel or whatever his name is, <laughs> Donnie. I just call him Donnie yeah. Yen. Donnie yeah. Yen's like partner. I don't know what his name is. No, it's just guy like, with a gun. That's why I call him. Yeah, like. I don't think almost anybody remembers his name. Like I somewhat know um, Riz Ahmed's character's name. It's like Bodie Rook or something. I kind of forget every once in a while, but like I somewhat know their names because I've had to look at this for a long time, but I honestly do not know that guy's name. Like literally you take him out. The movie probably gets better. Like mm -hmm. you could focus more. Like what, what Rogue One should have done was you take out Bodie, you take out the best friend of Donnie Yen's character because no one knows his name mm -hmm. and just focus on these four. Focus on K2SO, Cassian, Jen, and the Force user. Mm -hmm. And, like, you have more time to be with these characters, more time to breathe with them, and have more development with them. Yeah. Yeah. Or, Bertier, just take out Cassian and just have Galen Erso as a key plot point. Yeah, like, I mean, because like, you... Make him more, because he was, like, one of the best characters. Exactly. Because they they had actually... And Krennic, like, spend some time on Krennic, because yeah. he, he, they had this relationship, and if you, if you had read Catalyst, like, they, they had been friends, and there was something interesting, you know, to going on there, and... Any, I don't know. It's just frustrating. And like, you're supposed to be devastated when when this happens at the end, but... I felt nothing because I didn't yeah, care about everything. any of these characters. Like, and probably what you should have done was focus on one villain. I mean, yes, Darth Vader, I say keep that stuff. But yeah. when it comes to, like, Tarkin, like, I love Tarkin. He's one of the greatest <laughs> yeah. Imperial officers of all time. But you, you got to do one of two things. Get rid of Orson Krennic, focus on Tarkin as the main villain, or make Orson Krennic the main villain and have Tarkin only show up, like, at the very end when he's on that Death Star. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So I don't know. It was very like, they were just too focused on, we've got to make a star Wars movie versus making a good movie. Yeah. And I do feel like, I know people, people complain about force awakens, but in my opinion, that was a darn entertaining movie. When you look at the pacing, when you look at the, the characters, when you look at the action, uh, all of those things, uh, the humor the that is added. Yeah, I really do. I think the script was brilliant. They spent a year on that, and they like almost perfected the characters of all these new characters. I mean, BB-8, yeah. Poe Dameron, Finn, Kylo, and Ray—five new characters that yeah. we all loved. 
Mm-hmm. Next land is excluded, of course. Yeah, exactly. But. Like you could make an argument about like Captain Phasma was underused or something. I get it, but like for the most part, I was invested in all of those characters, and like they had interesting sort of takes on things, at least. You know, whereas like you never had a villain in star wars that was struggling with the light and yes. struggling with the darkness and that's what you got with kylo you got a character who who was was a sith that actually wasn't 100 percent sold i think on being a sith and then finally by the end he's he's there he's made you know obviously yes. he kills his father so he's there and you know you felt like this is a real apprentice this is somebody who you know is, is kind of a big baby and he's you know so you see something interesting, something different. And, and like I said, for me, at least I got enough of that in, in civil war to keep it interesting because I was so, inv- I'm so invested in Tony and Steve's characters at this point and sort of what they, what they, what they have kind of come to. And so I don't know, like, I'm just, I'm just frustrated. And I feel like so many of these movies that I go to, I feel like are just hollow and aren't, they're, they're supposed to be entertaining, but in order for, I think, a movie to be sort of popcorn, fun, fair, I think y- you have to, it has to be paced in a certain way, and it has to have characters that are charismatic and likable and that I am at least somewhat invested in, and it doesn't take necessarily a long time. I mean, in the original Star Wars, it's not like the plot is that great. And right? it's very simple, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> phone boy wants to have a better life, so he goes and saves the galaxy from a yeah. horrible spherical and, thing. <laughs> and you get to know so much about Han Solo in that one, in the introductory scene with, you know, with Greedo, yeah. and I mean, you, you get to know so much about him in one scene, so it doesn't take a lot. It just, uh, I don't know, I'm just frustrated. Like, and, much like a five-minute span, you understand, like, oh, he's a smuggler, smooth, scoundrel. He thinks highly of himself. Like, all in, like, a five-minute span, you yeah. get all of that. Yeah, and, I mean, another blockbuster that I liked last year was Star Trek Beyond, even though it didn't do all that well. But to me, I thought that that was a, had good, pretty good character development, and it, I yes. thought it was written pretty well. I liked seeing this dynamic between bones and Spock and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, you get a little bit of Chekhov and, and, uh, Kirk, and you get a little bit of, uh, I thought Sulu's character had some interesting dynamics growth to his character. And, and yeah, the villain is pretty lame in it, but I really like Jayla as a new character. I thought she was interesting. And you know, when she's just like, no, I will not go. I will not face that again. Like there was, I felt it. (laughs) I, I felt for her. You know, that kind of speaks to the unfortunate realization when they're trying to build like franchises and, and brands. It's like some of it is partially our fault because look at Star Trek. That wasn't like building up anything in the future. And it like, I think it lost money for the studios. Yeah. But like things like, I mean, I'm not knocking Marvel or Star Wars or anything, but like not completely original as much anymore yeah. but like they're making millions and billions of dollars of yeah. box office and merchandising it's like you know guys get out there and watch these original movies i mean i hear people complain like there's nothing original in hollywood anymore i'm like okay i'm gonna pull out a list here this is every single original movie that came out this year mm-hmm. did you even go see one of those no right there you go yeah like valerian's coming out this summer i bet nobody will see it and no. it may suck it may suck, but at least I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah, I mean, Luke Besson, I mean, he gave me the fifth element and uh, Leon the Professional. I mean, I'm honestly, a good trailer could take you a long way. I mean, I was, like, interested in this movie at first, but it all depends on the trailer because that, tra- that first trailer I thought was horrible. So I have, like, no expectations for it. Yeah. But, and, that, and that's the thing, like, take pride in, like, something newer and fresh, like, Give us good marketing yeah. for it. Like, look at Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, a that's a great brilliant example. brilliant movie. Yeah. And the marketing was awful. I did not plan on seeing that movie at all. But once the critics start saying, oh, it's amazing, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go see it. And then I loved it. I'm yeah. like, come on, this is a great movie here. This should be making <laughs> $700 million at the box office. 
I know. Some uh, sometimes I think that the studios are embarrassed by their good movies. It's like, yeah. <laughs> why are you take confidence? You? Take confidence. I know it's a risk. I know it's a risk, guys. You yeah. could lose your jobs in a second, but well, in like nope. last year, you had two good examples of uh, Kubo and the Two Strings and Pete's Dragon. Those were both beautiful epic heart-filled family films and people are always complaining like whenever there's like a smutty movie that comes out i always hear all these like um, my christian friends or mormon friends are all like oh you know hollywood they just make trash or whatever and i'm like no they make like a, a there's amazing family films out there but the problem is is that a lot of those movies nobody goes to see you know like secret life of pets will make a, a billion dollars and which it was fine. It was yeah, okay. Well, there's another example of a carbon Kubo, copy. Yes. Yeah. I think six, yeah. Yeah. like, no, it's, it's not a pet story. Like, you know, <laughs> like, established character, someone new comes in, they get separated from their house. They have to get back to their house. Yeah. There's conflict along the way. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, so Kubo, I mean, it made almost nothing. It made so little. And then Pete's Dragon, it, it did double its budget, which I was glad. But that was a movie that felt like old Yeller. It felt like, felt like the, the kind of family films that we never get anymore. You know, with yeah, you the, make the, a dragon relatable. You make yeah. A dragon relatable. Yeah. I didn't see in the theaters. I wish I would have because, yeah. well, I don't think they marketed that well though. Exactly. I felt like really Disney wasn't. was kind of embarrassed by it, and you're like, why? Why didn't you market this? This is it's, so it's good. A really, really good movie. <sighs> I mean, a dragon. You you fall in love with a freaking dragon. You can't make me fall in love with freaking a Star Wars character, but I fell in love with a dragon. <laughs> exactly. A fake, fictional, mythical being. Yeah. Oh, it's frustrating. And so my last topic that I want to talk about is I call it cgi aholics, And this is where I feel like every blockbuster looks exactly the same. And, you know, you'll have one that, like a, like a Doctor Strange, which at least, like, a tried visually to do something different. And uh, yes, it looked pretty cool. That. What's that? I will admit that. that yeah. was Visually, it was beautiful. And Jungle Book, it, it tried to do yes. something different, and it looked beautiful. And, you know, and so, but so many of these blockbusters look exactly the same. And they're spending millions of dollars on these, uh, you know, these almost $200 million budgets. And, and 100, you know, 150, 180, whatever, like a good example is this upcoming, the mummy. It looks like I, very expensive and, and they're trying to do a cinematic universe. You know, it's like, we've got to have the mummy and, and, and an invisible man and, and Jekyll and Hyde and whatever, all in the same universe for some reason. And, and I, but it looks so generic. It looks the same. Like maybe it's great. Who knows? I haven't seen it, but you know, the legend of Tarzan, the, um, uh, cost the, 200 million to make that actually no 180 million to make yeah. the legend of Tarzan. Yeah. I mean, uh, the special effects in fantastic beasts and where to find them legend of Tarzan. Um, the, I don't know. I could, keep going for forever like they just big, all look big. the same like at least batman v superman looked a little different yeah i mean you know i think they kind of i think zach snyder tries to do too much cgi i wish he would kind of be a little more practical but he has a visual flair to it it yeah. looks different and but here's another issue district nine do you know how much that budget was yeah it was 30 like million dollars yeah. with all well, that he, cgi and digital Pete's and it's Dragon. Cost 180 for freaking Legend of Tarzan. Pete's Dragon only cost $60 million to make. Yes, Pete's Dragon cost $60 million, And you make it a dragon with with a hairy dragon with threads <laughs> that are crisp and beautiful. Yeah. And it costs you $200 million to make this <laughs> generic Independence Day resurgence. Yeah, that's another one that just like felt so bland. There's no sense of like spectacle or like... Like I, I actually went and saw the... Um, I watched... Uh, I don't know if you heard about this movie, Bah Bali, that ended up in the top five last week. I only heard about it, about it uh, the week before. I'm like, number two? <laughs> there was a first one? I never yeah, heard yeah. of it before. And so I, went, I saw the first one. I rented it. And then I, I went and watched the second one. And they, I was so entertained. And they're just, because it was like, it was spectacle. 
he was like big and crazy and weird and and I don't know, you got a little bit, I'm not saying that Bob Bali is up there with Mad Max, but one of the things I think people loved about Mad Max, Mad Max Fury Road is that it was a spectacle. It yes. was something fresh and new and exciting. <laughs> and I, 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 beautiful, I, crisp and beautiful. I mean, I don't know how much Mad Max costs to make, but I don't know. That's it just was, one of my frustrations. Like I believe. Like, here, I'll, I'll, I'll double check it real quick, but yeah, like, it, it definitely made money back. I mean, it only made like $363 million at the worldwide box office. Yeah. And it was like one of the best movies of the year. It cost $150 million. Okay. And, I didn't think it was that much. Yeah. But, but yeah, at least it was crazy. like, there was a spectacle to it. it yes. You know, and I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of the, a lot of what this recent Beauty and the Beast did. Uh, in, as far as the CG, it looked pretty bad, but there was at least, I think, a sense of sort of these big musical set pieces that felt special and felt new. And so I did appreciate that, at least about it. And I don't know, there's just so many movies where I just leave feeling like. Yeah, I, I mean, de know. definitely. I mean, there was a time like before 2016 where like. Because I can think of like three movies that I had like out of this world ex expectations for, and all three of them met those expectations and even exceeded them. Like, you mm -hmm. go from The Dark Knight Rises to Interstellar to The Star Wars Force Awakens for me, all three astronomically high expectations, they all hit it. Yeah. And then it wasn't until 2016 where it finally came to a stopping halt when I had so much expectations for BVS and yeah. all these other movies. And it's like, yeah, these are, they're, it's definitely a mortal. Definitely mortal. Not everything yeah. perfect here. Because like last year you had, yeah, you had, uh, you had BVS, uh, you had, uh, then, then there was, there was Civil War. There was, I mean, you did have Jungle Book and Zootopia, which were a nice breath of, I think, fresh air. Uh, and then you had uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass. Talk about thought. being just like CGI bland so bland Tim and, Burton at his finest yeah oh my gosh and you had um miss peregrines did you see that no i never saw it oh it was so boring i was so bored i just i felt like it would never end there was just nothing special about it like there was one scene where i felt like oh tim burton we got him back <laughs> And I actually like big eyes from Tim Burton because I felt like, okay, you're making a smaller, quieter movie. You're not relying on your bombastic, yeah. weird, big headed Helena Bonner Carter characters. <laughs> it's like you're actually making real characters, even yeah. though Christoph Waltz was. Yeah. I thought he totally overacted was in, in a cartoon or something. <laughs> it's almost laughably. But it was better. I'll give you that for sure. And you know, it felt like, Oh, maybe we'll get a glimpse of the Tim Burton that I used to like, be excited like, about. I feel like it was like. different. I feel like it was like out of like yeah. If I was to watch the movie and you told me Tim Burton was directed, I'd be like, no way, no way. That's totally got to be some indie director that I don't know about. But like, that shows that Tim Burton has something yeah. more to offer than just his normal style. I mean, yeah. his style because they to, they all look the same. These more. movies end up being really boring because there's no like like Baja Bali Two was almost three hours and I was entertained through the whole thing because it's just so out there and crazy and different and refreshing and and I wasn't bored I was so bored in Miss Peregrine's like I thought it would never end and <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that I shouldn't like Baha Bali to the conclusion better than the latest Tim Burton movie that's so sad but it's true <laughs> I mean that you look at like um a long movie like in a show it's like oh it's too long it's like well it doesn't really matter if it's too long because i feel like say a movie like over wall street yeah i know you probably had never seen that before no. <laughs> but like you take over wall street compared to like yeah. a movie like fantastic four i'm gonna like the three hours is gonna go by so fast because that movie yeah. is like well made like despite the material that's covering like the production of it from martin scorsese and dicaprio it's like so well made but like fan four stick you go there, it's like, this is an hour, 48 minutes that feels like an entire day of my life wasted because this yeah. is so, it's dull. I mean, like, I don't understand, like, some people are like, oh, it's too dark or it's too light. Like, I don't think it's that. It's just how it's done. Because, like, say, like, The Dark Knight, a dark movie. 
but it's how it's presented. Yeah. And when you actually have characters that, that actually have like an arc and are interesting and, and uh, you have something that felt fresh and new and different. And I don't know. And yeah, something that's not dull that you can like delve into it's like whether it's a dark story or a light story it's all about how you can delve into it how you can invest in it mm-hmm. if you're if you can't do that then it's just going to be dull regardless of whatever the tone is yeah, yeah i agree uh, well so if you had like one sort of piece of advice uh, that you know to a studio what would you say uh, i would say wb disney paramount Sony, all of you, the the one thing that you guys have to do is not focus on a brand, focus on a story. Yeah. One story, just tell a good story. The brand will come if you tell a good story. Because if you don't tell a good story, then the brand's going to fail. Yeah. I'd say stop making movies by committee. Yes. Like, it works. Sure, the brain's trust works at Pixar. It works. But... It does. For the, that's because they have really, really creative minds and, and they, they are, are, and the process of making an animated film is just so long that, you know, yes. it, it just works better than other things. But for, for the most part, this idea of sort of corporate movie making is just ruining movies, I think. You know, it's like, well, we've got to have, we've got to have a brand, we've got to have a, we got to have toys, we got to have, you know, all this stuff out of it. And so you, you you know, we're, we've got to have seven, like when they announced they, they have this Power Rangers movie that actually was semi-decent and, but, but they announced that they're going to make seven movies and they're going to, they're going to have, uh, you know, all this franchise and everything like that. Like let your directors make an idea that they have and let them try cool. things, let them, you know, tell a good story. Like I, I was, somebody was saying like, oh, well they, uh, they can't have another Joker in the WB because in the DCU because oh well they've already had Jared Leto's Joker and it's a cinematic universe I'm like screw that <laughs> like if it's not working like tell a good story and tell a uh, and nobody cares like the fans don't do care give me another Lex Luthor I don't want Jesse Eisenberg yeah. back Keep the fans don't care like the fans want a good I'm movie good. you know like nobody cares that's like well this isn't Jared Leto if it's a good movie, nobody cares. And uh, so, I don't know, just focus on, like, let your creative people, your directors, your producers, your other things like that, make creative, interesting movies with ideas, with characters that we care about, and uh, and just stop with the corporate movie making and the franchises and cinematic universes. I know it's never going to stop because they make so much money, but I don't know, it's just... Uh, it's frustrating. Like, One why couldn't day. we get like a creepy, scary mummy movie? Why do we have to get this like this CGI generic blockbuster, blockbuster, yeah, movie. Mission Impossible esque, you know, thing? Like, like what a missed opportunity. I mean, I was looking forward to it, but the trailers have just not done it for me. No, like maybe it's great. Who knows? But I, I doubt it. I highly doubt it. And it's just like, just make a movie with heart, with characters that we care about. Focus on that. Focus on the ideas, and 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 just stop with. I don't know. Just these. Stop these with movies. the corporate greed. Yeah. Make it with passion. These I mean, movies sure, that just feel so hollow. Say. I mean, the executives they can have their say, but like let the let the filmmakers tell the story. You can yes. give them like some notes, but don't don't turn it into a situation where if you're a sports team, don't take over the coach's team. Let the coach. Yeah. Coach them. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, well, feels good to to get this off of our chest a little bit. Hopefully, uh, get it all out. Just vent it out. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully there will be it'll be better this year than last year, but I highly doubt it, unfortunately. But I'm pulling. I'm hoping at least Wonder Woman is good. I, just, I want Wonder Woman and Justice League to be good. Like. I love, I love, I love DC. I love my Batman. I love my Superman. Like, just I've waited so long for a Justice League movie. Just mm-hmm. make it. That's the good. funny thing is people think that like, oh, I hate DC or something like that. Which I'm not the biggest Batman fan, but I love Superman and I like a good movie. You know, yes. like <laughs> I love like, Batman. I'm a fan of good movies. <laughs> yeah. I'm a fan of good movies. 
And so I, I, I would never, it's stupid. If you go into a movie expecting it to be awful, that's dumb. No, it's, it's a waste of money. Yeah. Waste of time and waste of money. And so I go into it ex- hoping to be entertained, hoping to have a good experience. And, and, you know, just most of these movies, like I don't have a horrible experience, but they're just kind of like, eh. So I, I hope that, uh, I, I don't know, I hope things improve and hope we get another 2014 one of these days. Yes. God, what a brilliant year. Because we had Inside Out that year also. Which was so well, that was 2015. 14. I'm, 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 oh. I'm pretty sure Inside Out was 2015. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. But I loved Inside Out so much. Uh, yeah, it was. Oh, yeah. Bigger like, Six was uh, 2014, which I also, I, I did like. So. Like a movie should have won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, where can people find you? All right. Well, everybody, you can find me on Twitter at master underscore underscore DG. You can also follow me or find me on YouTube at just my name, David Gerlock. I'm sure my name will be in the description. If not, you can find it in any of her past podcasts that we've done together. <laughs> so yeah. And, uh, yeah, come at me, tell me I'm a Marvel hater. I'm a DC <laughs> hater, even though I've claimed I love like Iron Man and the dark Knight. So yeah. 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 Thanks for hey, having me on. I mean, I, I, I didn't like Rogue One and I love Star Wars. So yeah, big mass Star Wars fan. I've, yeah. I have Star Wars underwear. <laughs> Maybe I got too personal there, but you know, that's how extreme I am. I yeah. have Star Wars clothes, the Max, a uh, Star Wars, everything. Like, I freaking, I bought Star Wars Legos again, just so I could play a Star Wars D and D campaign. Yeah. Yeah. As a 22 year old <laughs> grown man, I bought Legos again. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I had my toys and all that stuff too. I've got my lightsaber. Uh, but anyway, oh, well. Uh, so thanks so much for, for joining me. This I really appreciate it. It was fun for me. And uh, yeah, check out David's channel and uh, we will see what happens in the, uh, in the next couple of months with summer blockbuster season. Yeah. <laughs>